Welcome back to Film Flick Recap. Today, we will be talking about a true life story movie, The Lone Survivor. Join us. The United States SEAL program is considered the toughest military training all over the world. The men are taken through rigorous exercise including staying under the water for hours and running several miles in harsh weather conditions. Only the bravest of the brave are fit enough to see out the training. Many fall by the wayside and only few make it to the end. The events of this movie are a life story. Through the desert lands, a helicopter transports a wounded man, Marcus Luttrell, a SEAL. He was mortally wounded and fighting for his life. At the U.S. military base, the medical team attempted severally to resuscitate the soldier. Through a voiceover, Marcus tells us that there is a storm raging inside every man, and that it is like a burning, a river, a drive. This is what pushes us beyond our limits. The movie cuts to three days earlier. At the U.S. Bagram Air Base in Kabul, Afghanistan, Michael Murphy, a SEAL lieutenant, wakes to an email from his girlfriend. She wants a horse as her wedding present. Murphy showed the pictures to Marcus who told him that it would be an expensive gift, but Marcus promised to find out the price for him. Murphy then went on his routine morning jog with another SEAL, Danny Dietz. Matt Axelson, another member of the team, joined others outside just as Murphy and Danny made it back to base from their intense run. They debated whether Danny should shave his hair since he lost the race, and the youngest member of the team, Shane Patton, was to make the call. He told them any of their decisions would be fine by him. Commander Eric Christensen announced that their next operation was for later that evening. Shane will not be joining the team. In the briefing, we learn that the objective of the mission is to capture and kill Admat Shah. He is a top-ranking Taliban leader who has killed several U.S. Marines. He is a ruthless enforcer who does not forgive anyone who helps the American. The SEALs are warned that the terrains are mostly steepy and that they may have challenges with their comms during the operation. As the team went through the tactical approach, we see Shah capture a local who was suspected to have disclosed information about the Taliban's and behead him in front of the entire village. The operation will have two teams. Murphy, Marcus, Danny, and Matt will go in while the other team will be the Quick Reaction Force QRF, team. Later that evening, Shane was made to dance and entertain the men and afterwards, the men went to prepare for the mission. The choppers came in that evening and they shipped out. They arrived at the destination point and were lowered to the ground. Switching to night vision, Danny checked the comms with the QRF team at Jabad base and they confirmed. The team proceeded on the hilly paths throughout the night and eventually arrived at their final waypoint and called base to confirm. The comms were beginning to break but Danny managed to get the message across and the second team prepared to join them. However, they could not get good visuals of the town they suspected Shah was and they had to change locations. The team got to a higher ground and as Marcus scanned the town with a monocular, Danny searched for better signals for the comms and others took their positions. Marcus saw who he thought was Shah and Danny took pictures of the other Talibans in the town and forwarded to base. Murphy said they were too exposed and they took cover behind the bushes. He and Marcus talked about the horses for a while as they waited for the QRF team to respond. While others rested, Danny noticed some movements in the bushes, then some goats appeared, followed by a man and his two sons. Other team members got alerted and waited to see what would happen. Unfortunately, one of the boys stepped on Marcus' foot prompting others to jump into action. They swiftly routed up the man and the boys and tired them up. Marcus discovered a radio on the man and Murphy decided to report to base to know the next line of action. The comms were still not connecting so he used an unsecured line. He was told that Commander Christensen was at Bagram base and his call was transferred to the base. Shane picked the call and ran to get Christensen when he realized it was Murphy calling. Before the commander could get to the phone, Murphy had lost connection. Christensen wondered why Murphy was calling on an unsecured line. Unable to connect to base, Murphy told the men that there are three options available for them to deal with the situation. One is to let the man and boys go while the team moves. Second is to tie them up and leave. The third option is to terminate the compromise. Marcus, Matt and Danny argue the implications of each option until Murphy told them that they would cut the man and the boys loose while the seals make for the top of the hills. There, they should be able to get comms up and they'd return to base. They all agreed to the plan. Meanwhile at the Jabad base, the fighter choppers, the Apaches, that were part of the QRF were called for another mission due to the limited resources. The team let the captured men go and stood back to watch them. Marcus was still very much in doubt whether this was the best decision but they had no choice. The team turned and headed for the mountaintops so they could get signals for the comms. The eldest of the two boys is shown to hurry off with speed and gallop through the rocky plains with much haste. Jabad Base was still attempting to contact the team when they got to the top of the mountain only to discover it was a false summit. Matt twisted his ankle and they decided to rest for a while. Matt noticed some movements in the woods and all the men became alert as they examined the woods carefully. 
Murphy went to scan the mountaintop where he saw that they were surrounded by Talibans. He returned and told the men to prepare for contact. They were amazed at how fast the Talibans had gotten to them. Marcus took out the first two men and the Taliban opened fire. They exchanged shots as the SEALs kept moving and changing positions. Danny was shot while trying to establish contact and the Taliban got closer to the men. The more they shot and killed the Taliban, the more reinforcement they got. Matt, Marcus and Murphy were shot in different parts and they retreated until they got to a cliff. A propelled grenade landed behind them and they were thrown off the cliff. They rolled and hit against the rocks and trees as they went down the mountain. They miraculously survived but each man sustained severe injuries. Just as the SEALs thanked God for surviving the fall with just the wounds they had, the Taliban's attacked again. Danny was shot and Matt had to drag him along until they got behind a rock and took refuge. Marcus tended to their injuries as he was the less injured amongst the men. He also encouraged them to keep faith but the Taliban got to them and attacked yet again. While they attempted to jump down another cliff, Danny was shot and he fell behind. The Taliban's got to him and stripped him of his valuables while recording him. Matt, Murphy and Marcus were still being fired at, at the base of the hill and Murphy, no longer seeing the possibility of them coming out this battle alive, told Marcus that he will attempt getting to the hilltop and make the call. He gave Marcus his remaining ammo and went for the hilltop. Marcus and Matt covered him and took out many of the Taliban's as they advanced. Murphy managed to get to the top of the hill and made the call to Jabad base. But as he called and reported their position he was shot severally and eventually killed just about the same time when Danny was killed. The message got across to the base and the QRF team ready to move out but they are told that the Black Hawks they are taking can only leave base when they have the Apaches for cover. Unknown to Christensen that the Apaches were not with them, two choppers with several men had already left base. It was quiet for a while and Marcus talked with Matt. Matt was still finding it hard to believe that Danny and Murphy are dead and he tells Marcus that if he dies, he should tell his wife that he died with his men. The Taliban's attacked yet again and they split up. About the same time, Christensen was warned that the Apaches were not with them, but they were already at the drop point. They decided to use the second chopper as cover. The choppers arrived amidst loud cheers from Marcus and Matt. But as the soldiers prepared to descend from the planes, an RPG was fired into it causing it to explode and killing all the soldiers on board. The second was forced to turn back and Marcus knew they were damned. The Taliban continued firing at them and Matt was shot and fatally wounded. He continued to fire his pistol as the men approached from different sides. He ran out of ammo, and he was killed by a shot through the forehead. Marcus, unaware that Matt was dead, called out for him. A blast threw him off another cliff, and he had to take cover between the rocks as the men searched for him. That was when the Apaches arrived, but he could not show his face for fear he would be killed by the Talibans. He stayed in his hiding through the nights, and it was only when he woke that he discovered that he had pieces of rock in his body. After a long and painful walk, he found a lake. He dragged himself near it and just fell into the water. He drank the water, and when he turned there were some men and a child standing behind him. He quickly grabbed a grenade and threatened to pull the pin if they came closer. They heard the Taliban approaching and one of the men, Gulab, offered to help Marcus but he wasn't sure at first. In the end, he decided to allow the man to help him. Gulab and his son took Marcus to their village and into his home. Still unsure what was happening, Marcus asked Gulab if he knew where the American base was. Gulab's neighbor was hostile and asked Gulab why he was helping an American. In the heat of the argument, Marcus brought out the grenade again and threatened to detonate it. Gulab ended up getting a messenger to help Marcus deliver his message to the U.S. base. Just as the messenger left, the Taliban's arrived and captured Marcus and took him for execution. As they beat him and prepared to behead him, Gulab and the other men of the village got their guns and threatened to kill the Taliban's if they didn't allow Marcus to go. The leader of the Taliban, Tarek, asked why they'd rather die for an American. Gulab said Marcus is their guest and that they always keep their guests safe no matter what. The Taliban's threatened to return and slaughter everyone in the village as they left. Inside the house, Marcus asked Gulab's son to get a knife for him, but he couldn't understand him and instead got a duck. The father understood better and got the knife. He was almost killing the duck when Marcus told him that he needed the knife for himself. Marcus tore off his trousers and proceeded to remove the rock particles on his body. Gulab changed Marcus' clothes and cleaned him up when he slept. The men of the village prepared and waited for the inevitable attack from the Talibans. The next morning, Gulab woke Marcus and gave him food and water. It was the first time he was eating in days and Gulab had to slow him down so he did not choke. Before he could finish his food, the Taliban attacked the village with all their armory. About the same time, the messenger had gotten to the U.S. base and delivered Marcus' message. The Apaches, bombers, and rescue teams were sent out. Back at the village, the men tried to hold off the Taliban attack, but they were failing. 
Golob killed one of the men who attacked him and Marcus also fought off another who got into the house. He killed the man and held Golob's son close as the other Taliban got closer to them. About when all hope of rescue was lost, the Apaches and the bombers arrived at the village and cleared off the Taliban chasing the rest into the mountains. The soldiers set up a parameter and went in to rescue Marcus. They got to him and took him to the waiting plane but he turned and thanked Golob and hugged his son. He was very grateful for their help. He was barely alive as the medical team took over his care inside the plane. The scene cuts back to the start of the movie. They resuscitated and injected him. Via a voiceover, Marcus tells us that he died on those mountains with his brothers. Because of his brothers, he was alive. He says we are never really out of fights. InNote revealed that the movie is dedicated to the men of Operation Red Wings. The movie ends by showing real-life pictures and video clips of the fallen men. Christensen, Shane, Danny, Murphy, and Matt. It also shows a write-up that the Afghan villagers have a long-standing tradition of helping and keeping their guests safe, protecting them at all cost. Then, a picture of Marcus and Gulab is shown. I hope you enjoyed the movie. You can also watch these other true life story movie recaps on the page. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and also like our videos. Until the next recap, stay safe.